everyone. So yeah, my name is Rachel. I graduated from Georgetown from the SF from the SFS as a STEM major in 2019, um, after which I actually moved down to North Carolina and started working at RTI International as a public health analyst. Um, in terms of my career journey, I would say just from like, I had done different and in, had different internship experiences um, during college. And a lot of that kind of just was spread out within the healthcare sector. So I did a summer working at an HIV AIDS clinic in LA doing more like health administration and helping them move over from paper to their EHR system. Um, I did another summer with the American Lung Association and did more policy and advocacy work, which was more community level. Um, and then the third summer I had in college was actually at a health software company. So they're an EHR startup that's based in San Francisco. So just learning about how to market e new EHR systems. And that one was unique in the sense that they were heavily for iOS and like an Apple products, which is not normally the case. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about um, health records, but um, yeah, that was an interesting experience. And then I guess like the culmination of all of that ended up with me working at RTI um, where I currently work on various federal as well as nonprofit projects. Um, I, get, I think that kind of goes into the second question though about, yeah, uh, what my day-to-day -day looks like. So within these projects, um, I do hold a number of different roles. It also really depends on how, on how you're selected to work on a specific project. So there are some projects where I am more on the project management side. So it will be all kind of be participating in meetings, helping to coordinate everyone's schedule um, or taking notes. And then there are other aspects of the project where it's more like data management, data analysis. Um, there are some parts where I'll do some report writing. So I'm involved in writing a couple of manuscripts right now based on some of our evaluation reports. Um, we also participate in site visits, which were canceled because of COVID. So I've actually never gone on one, but had had, had we had normal um, norm, a normal year, I probably would have gone on a couple site visits to go visit um, some cancer practices to see how they're enjoying like working with some of the projects that we're doing with them. So yeah, that's kind of my day to day work. Would you mind digging in a little bit more in terms of you know what were some of these papers or research? papers that you wrote as well as you know when you do these site visits what does that look like what are you hoping to, to learn yeah so I can start with the paper so right now um, we're putting together a report for I want to say it's a federal level report about primary care um, projects with across the U.S. so we looked at what types of projects have certain states done to um, to increase the amount of primary care access um, to people in their state and then based off of that report that we're writing for the client, part of it is also writing a separate manuscript. So it's going to be kind of just generalizing the findings from that report. Um, the other two manuscripts I'm working on are more from, it's called the State Innovations Model Project. That's also a federal report, but that's looking at um, how do we get states to kind of transfer more from fee-for-service payment. So this is going to get a, this might get a little technical, but basically instead of paying for every single service that you receive at a clinic, it's like, if we know that you're going to come in for a very specific reason, then we can already assume that you're going to get like five different types of things done. So we'll bundle that payment. So it's just kind of transferring the way that payment works um, within the healthcare system. And we've just been trying to test this out in about 12 different states. Um, so it's one of the reports is going to be more, be more focused on pediatrics. So how did pediatric clinics like find working within this model? What did we find in terms of like, did, were they actually able to decrease like their cost of, um, the total cost of care? Um, did children come into the emergency department less? Did they come back after an inpatient visit more often? Just things like that. So it's more, it's going to be more summarizing findings. Um, in terms of the other larger like site visit projects that I've been on, um, we've done, we're, I'm working on the oncology care model right now. So that is a implement, we're working on the implementation side. So we work with about 170 cancer practices across the US. Um, and we're saying like, okay, can you change the way that you interact with your patients? Um, 
instead of having you like sit at the computer with the patient standing next to you, are there certain things that we can include into like that health interaction to make that experience a little bit better? Do pe do patients feel like they're getting more targeted attention? And then hopefully um, being able to also like bring them into um, the decision-making process. We're hoping that they'll overall just have a better experience as well as um, targeting some more financial things. So again, like trying to decrease how much they're, they're paying out of pocket for, um, for their cancer treatment. So the site visits are going to the practices and asking them like, okay, we've asked you to do all these things. Like how has that experience been? Has it been extremely difficult? Are there certain things that we've asked of you to talk to patients that you don't really feel comfortable doing. Um, and we'll take that feedback and also get go back to um, go back to the client and say like, okay, these practices came back saying X, Y, Z. Is there a way that we can tweak it a little bit or take this into consideration for like future, future versions of the model basically? So, yeah. It's really helpful. Thank you for diving deeper. And, you know, obviously payment of healthcare, um, you know, it's just, just such an important, important issue. So I'm really mm -hmm. happy to yeah. hear that you're working on it and it sounds like very meaningful work. Um, okay, well, if you could tell us what went into your decision to apply for an MPH uh, program. So you're at John Hopkins, tell us more about that and what do you hope to gain from that program? Yeah, so I am actually doing, I'm doing an MSPH in the International Health Department at Johns Hopkins. And my concentration is in global disease epidemiology and control. So um, I picked this program because I did want to go back into the international health field. Um, when I was at Georgetown in the STIA, um, under the STIA major, my concentration was global tech and biohealth. So I think just having gone through all of that, I knew even after working after two years that that's kind of the field that I wanted to go back into. Um, and I'm more specifically interested in doing international health security and like health preparedness basically. So um, because Hopkins within their eye health department has like that epidemiology and control um, aspect, it did feel a little bit more technical than just learning more about global health in general. So that's probably the reason I, that is the reason that I picked that program. Um, and there are definitely other universities that have that as well. Um, I think another aspect is they have a really good environmental health department, which I've always been interested in learning more about. And I don't think that was something that I had the chance to explore while I was an undergrad. Um, so a lot of, I'm taking a lot of classes in that department, which feels a little separate, but I think because in the end, I do want to bring all those components together. Um, it was just nice to find a school that was highly focused on both. So, um, what else? Um, I know that they have a center for health security. So looking at like the institutes and centers that the different universities offered was kind of a big um, aspect for in my grad school search. Um, and because a lot of the professors in different departments will also like they they cross when it comes to centers and institutes. So you being able to find different opportunities and um, in different areas within the university, not just within the academic departments. Um, I thought that would be a really great opportunity as well. And then um, finally, I also have a practicum component to my program. So that was also a big thing for me. I think being able to kind of not, not necessarily go abroad, but I would say most people in my department do go abroad and just to build some field work experience. Um, and because the school is also so well connected, you can really find yourself anywhere. Um, so yeah, I think those are the, the key the key things that pulled me here. How will that that's great? How will that work with RTI? Will you be able to combine you know your work with RTI with that practicum in some way, or will that be a separate thing? Um, so I'm actually not entirely sure yet how it's going to go. Um, I've heard from a few people that there's a possibility that the school might actually let me do my practicum with RTI. I just need to kind of phrase it in that way, but I think I would still like to try something a little bit different. So I might just take a leave, leave of absence from RTI for a couple months. Cause I think it's my requirement. I think it's a full, like full-time four month practicum. Um, so yeah, I'll probably, I might just take a leave for four months and try to do something different. Yeah. That makes sense. So you can get that global, global aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, well, this is my last question. So for the audience, feel free to put something in the chat. 
your questions or you can raise your hands after uh, whatever works best for you. Um, my last question is, what would you have done differently while at Georgetown knowing what you now know? Yeah, I think one, one thing I would have definitely done more is just try to look at, again, some of the centers that Georgetown does have in areas of areas of research that you are particularly interested in. Um, I realized that there are definitely a lot more opportunities than like I thought there was as an undergrad student to be like a research assistant or just to help out at any type of project. And I think that experience would have been extremely helpful. Um, and the second would have been to, I think, just build more experiences wherever I could. So whether that would have been from volunteering or just doing a little bit more community service to learn about like a specific area or population. Um, I think, especially now with you having to learn so much about how do you like cater care towards an individual or to a community. Um, I think we're seeing more that obviously like there's more than just like, we're, these people are more than just numbers, right? Um, there are a lot of things that in, environmental factors, social factors, cultural factors that come into play it, specifically when it comes to their healthcare. So I think learning about even like one population can teach you so much um, and just having that experience to build upon that and say, next time you go and do another project somewhere else, you'll know, okay, there is more than, they're more than just numbers. Like um, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. Um, so yeah, I think those are, those are some key things I wish I'd done more. <laughs> There's plenty to do at Georgetown without all those other things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there really is. Well, so what other questions do you all have that um, you want to ask? This is your time. Okay, so what inspired you to go into the cancer health space? That's a good question, it's needy. Um, so I actually did not choose that specifically. Um, and it was just one of the projects that I got pulled on to join. But oddly enough, I do work on a lot of cancer projects now that I think about it. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes to picking projects, sometimes when you're, at least for RTI, like when you are hired, they're normally hiring because they're, they do need to fill, fill a gap in a specific project. So for me, that just ended up being the oncology care model. Um, but as I've been working there, you do also work on many different projects at the same simultaneously. So, and you also have the opportunity to pick a lot of those projects on your own as well. If you can connect with other people within the organization, like just reaching out to them being like, hi, like, I know that you're working on this project. I'm really interested in this space. Um, sometimes like, I mean, obviously it's not like it will always work out that way, but, um, I think through that, I've gotten to work in different, not only just in my department, but also across like different programs within RTI as well. So um, yeah, it's really, it's really just like find also finding opportunities for yourself within the organization. Yeah. How many projects would you say you've been involved in or how and how mm -hmm. long is a typical project at RTI? Yeah, so those really range. Um, I, so for 2020, I had, was working on five projects. Um, two of them are extremely large federal projects. Um, and then three of them were much smaller. The smallest ones and the shortest ones would go like is a year for us. A year is extremely short. I don't even know if we do projects that are shorter than that. And then for the oncology care model, that is a five-year contract five-year contract yeah and I think we're in year five right now so they go for extremely long periods of time I know that there's like a there's a radio um radiology like care model as well that's also related to cancer that one's an eight-year project so RTI definitely does a lot of the longitudinal <laughs> um projects for CMS yeah that makes sense um, I know that students were interested in your MPH, um, I mean, MSPH at, at John Hopkins. And I know you said a little bit about why you chose that program, but mm -hmm. can you say more about, I don't know, how you went about finding the program and the application process and what that looked like? Sure. So um, I had initially started looking at epidemiology 
programs um, because I did want to do something more technical for grad, for grad school. Um, so based on that, I kind of just looked for what schools really offer that, but I did also know I wanted to do infectious diseases, like just more into that global health field as well. So I would say like you have your large universities, Hopkins, um, Emory, BU, uh, UNC Chapel Hill, just because so many people at RTI do come from there. Um, and then based on that, I was initially predominantly looking at NPH programs actually. So I would say the main thing, the main, I guess, technical difference between MPHs and MSPH programs are that MPHs are, are, pre are like professional degrees. You're expected to go into the program um, and kind of come out and join the workforce again. At least that's the way that the universities will explain it to you. Whereas MSPH programs are a little bit more academic. There is slightly more of a research component to it. Um, but I want, I want to say for Hopkins, the difference between the MPH and MSPH, it's not, it's not that big. It's aside from the fact that the MPH is a one-year program and you do, you are required to come in with minimum two years full-time work experience. So that's also kind of, that's not a standard, but I would say a lot of the MPH programs are like that regardless of what school you apply to. Um, there are obviously programs, there are obviously schools that are not like that, but I would say having work experience is extremely helpful. Um, I, would, I would say that. Um, what else would be on this page difference? Um, with the MPH program at Hopkins, you also don't choose a, you don't choose a department. You don't apply into a specific department because it is a very short year. And most students have already come in from working. A lot of them do tend to have somewhat of a better idea on what field they want to go into. So they kind of just congregate everyone and then let everyone kind of pick which areas they are already interested in going into. Whereas with the internet, with the MSPH program, because you can apply straight from undergrad, um, as long as you have like a general idea of where you want to go, they'll help build some of those like basic skills as well um, within the department. And then you can still cross take across, um, across the departments. Um, what else? So I think for me, or I think with COVID, I did have to take the GRE, but I don't think that by the time I applied, I was required to submit it because of, because of COVID. Um, and I don't know how that's gonna change in the next couple of years, but yeah, there's definitely that um, public health school applications have a separate system altogether. So I think when you, we applied to college, there was a, there's a common app. Yeah, so the public health school common app version is called SOFIS. Um, and actually, if you go in there, you can look for, there'll basically be a whole list of every single public health program that is available um, within the US, basically. Some schools will have additional applications that you have to put in, in a, like after you put in your SOFIS application. So I know UC Berkeley and um, UNC Chapel Hill are both like that. So um, those are some things to keep in mind. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if there's any other spe more specific questions about application process that I could answer. But. If there's questions, put them in the chat. Um, I have a question while we're waiting is how you balance this with, with working. And you know, I know some employers also offer tuition benefits. Um, and so if, if you wouldn't mind sharing, you know, what RTI offers or what you found with that and just your decision of taking a gap year and then applying, love to hear just more about your experience with that. Yeah, so um, I'm currently full-time school and part-time at RTI. I work about roughly 20 hours a week right now. So it's like 50% of full-time essentially. And it's really possible mainly because I think with full-time school, you're not spending all your full eight hours of a day sitting at a desk. <laughs> um, like you go in, you go in and out of classes. So I actually only have in-person class once a week right now, but that's mainly more due to COVID. Um, I have two asynchronous classes. And because of that, my time during the day, during the week tends to be more free. So I work um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays. And then I have all of Friday off for both school and work. And then I can I mainly end up listening to the asynchronous lectures on Friday. <laughs> um, 
but I've been doing this for, I've been doing both for about two weeks now. It hasn't been long, but there, it definitely was an adjustment period. Um, I have, so for Hopkins, we're also going by eight week terms. So Georgetown's like a 15 week semester and then we have eight week terms and then switch again. So actually I have midterms this week. Um, so I think just like the fast pace of it and just getting used to that balancing out work and being able to communicate with my coworkers. Like I just have sp specific deadlines I have to meet for school, um, but communicating that beforehand. Um, and they're all really understanding. So, and, and a lot of them have obviously been in this position before as well. So that's, yeah, that's kind of just how I've been balancing that. Did you, did yeah. you go part-time after you got accepted into the program? I went part-time September 1. Yeah. So I basically worked like during the summer and then just started school. I took, a, I think that it took about two weeks off to start school and just give myself some time to readjust. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question from Julia. Uh, can you talk more about your practicum and what practicum opportunities there are for international health security? Yeah, so I am hoping that maybe I can do my practicum at uh, the Center for Health Security at Hopkins. Um, I believe that their center is actually under the environmental health and possibly under the engineering school, or it's like a joint with the engineering and public health school. Um, there are a lot of different departments at the university right now and, or not, sorry, not departments, but like institutes and centers that will also offer practicum. So I would, one of my mentors who's a second year in the program, there's a vaccine policy institute, I, I believe that's what it's called at Hopkins. And they actually offer, um, scholarships to go work in Geneva at WHO and Gavi. So she's actually going, she, she just left for Gavi last week and she'll be there until December, but that's going to be like her practicum opportunity. Um, I know other students who do just continue to work at the university, um, but I don't know too much beyond that right now, just because the second year students have had so many restrictions in terms of going abroad um, and just getting clearance from the university as to like whether or not tra your travel is considered essential because of COVID. So um, yeah, sorry, I wish I could touch on that more, but. Um, if you are interested in international health security, um, Hopkins also has a, they just came out with a PhD program for health security. It's under the environmental health program though. I think it's a PhD in environmental health and then there's a health security track. I believe it might be the only program in the country. I am interested in applying for their um, DRPH program, which is a part-time program. But um, yeah, if that's something you're interested in, they, they do have that available. I think they just started that um, September, 2020. So it's extremely new. And, you know, for those of you who may not know, there is a Center for Global Health Science and Security also at Georgetown, and they do hire student researchers. So that's a place if you are interested to, to check out. Um, another question, wondering if you remember any interesting global health classes from your time at Georgetown? What were some of your favorite classes? Um, let's see. I took two classes with Dr. Uh, Rebecca Katz. So she does environment, no, global health, uh, security and diplomacy, which is really interesting. And then I think the term, the semester after she did emerging infectious diseases, um, those are both really fascinating. I also did um, global health ethics. I, that, yeah, that one was a really interesting one, just learning about, it, it, it has, a lot of it has to do with like research ethics as well, but learning about how do you not go into a country and just bring in Western ideals? Like how do you meet a community where they're at um, to do research in a respectful way? So I think that, that was a really great class as well. Um, there's also gender health and development. That one's under the NHS, I believe. I forget who teaches that though. Yeah. Okay, and last question, putting you on the spot a little bit here, but you know, la any last words of wisdom? So these students, they put in your shoes, you're now, you know, what, two years out, any, anything you would wanna share to end on tonight? Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like if there's something you are really interested in, I think there's more than enough information out there for you 
to to find it um obviously like schoolwork is hard like I mean I, re I really tend to struggle sometimes um but I feel like people are also more than willing to help you um and I wouldn't be like nervous about reaching out to people if you know that they're kind of in that field that you want to go into and just trying to get a sense of like how do I get from where I am now to where I want to be and for me like I'm still trying to figure that out as well especially because doing health security there isn't a very it's not a really straightforward path so just seeing like okay what positions are really out there what 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 can I like aspire to kind of achieve at this point and it's like yeah just learning about their walk their like their career path and figuring out like is that something I can continue on as well is that is there something else I'm interested in is there another way that I can get there it's it's a, it's kind of a creative process but um yeah I mean hopefully if and I mean I'm more than happy to help out anyone who needs who has questions that they need answered um but yeah I mean you guys are all doing great <laughs> school is definitely hard but yeah you'll you'll definitely get through it so